<laughs> okay, let's do it. Everybody's ready? So, today, uh, lecture three, we're moving along the axis of different things we're focusing on. So, if last time it was about uh, sizes, mostly, so today we'll talk about concentrations and absolute numbers. And the first thing I want to go through is like, you know, you, you, except for the lectures, you're trying to do hands-on experience through the exercises. I know it takes a few hours uh, to handle and grapple and fight with the exercises. I, I hope it's time well spent for you. I do want to point out, for example, that uh, also in the next exercise, we'll also be pointing you to go and read on the online version of the book Cell Biology by the Numbers. And the reason why we do that is mostly because I think it... Uh, mimics also what is expected of you in the final uh, exercise that you'll be doing. Uh, the summary of the, of the course, if you like, is to try and write something along those lines of like a few pages on a question that interests you and to try and bring together relevant numbers and some insights or something along, the, along those lines. So I hope that through that you're both reading and learning more and also getting a feel for what you might be achieving yourself. Any comments on last time, on the exercises, on numbers in the world? Something uh, you want to share? If you do, you know, you can come in, uh, in the recess, shoot us an email, talk with uh, Leo, with Ron Sender, with myself, anything. Okay, one thing I want to start with is talking about digits for a minute, uh, significant digits. It's something that uh, might come both in the exercise, but I think in life in general. So let's take a concrete example. Um, if I'm, you know, if I'm calling, you know, somebody is, is calling me and I'm telling you, I'll come back to you in five minutes, okay? And then say 50 seconds later, somebody asks you, what about Ron? Is he supposed to call you? And so you could tell them uh, he's, he'll call me in like four minutes and 10 seconds. But that's not really the essence of what's happening here, right? You probably, what would you say? Okay, so either you say five minutes or four minutes, you won't say four minutes and ten seconds because it conveys too much accuracy, too much information given the, given the situation. Okay, whether you choose after 50 seconds to leave it at five minutes even though some time elapsed or turn it into four minutes, that's up to you. But I think you get the notion that four minutes, ten seconds makes no sense. In the same spirit, we have the issue of significant digits in many of the things we're doing. And I think it repeats itself, you know, throughout, you know, in science you often see it. And I think it's good to remember those sorts of examples. So let's take another example. Let's say I'm telling you that I measured, you know, HeLa cells. Okay, very common mammalian cells. And I was measuring, let's say, three cells. And their uh, volume is... 10,000 micrometer cubed. And then the question that, you know, you don't usually report things in the papers about what's the weight of three cells. You'll be reporting the weight of one cell. And the question is, what would you report? What's the good number to write here? Yeah, but now you have to write the number. What would you? 3.33. Okay, so, so I think, uh, so we're having 3.33. So that's, uh, you want to make it this way. Right? Uh, let's make it 10 to the 4. That's what I want. That's what you're suggesting, right? Anybody else suggest something else? Okay, so we have several options. So there's 3 times 10 to the 3. 10 to the 3. 10 to the 3. Oh, you just uh, consider them as 1. 1. Because 3 is like you cannot measure some. Okay, so I think, uh, the, ah, so like you just put it as like 10 to the 4. Yeah. Like what? Oh, 
Great. So, okay, we have a diversity of options. It's kind of like a real dilemma in the sense that, like, you would all sometimes find that people really do report, like, you know, they, they do the calculation and they give you whatever comes in, whatever they're working with, Excel or something else. And you would find like 3.3333, or actually, it's more common when it's not round numbers. When it's like, it would be like they would report it as like 3.49652. Now, you might guess that, you know, kind of like with the five minutes, maybe this 10 to the 4 micrometer cube, I wasn't, you know, it's usually not meaning that it's like 1000.000, right? So if I was in the dilemma, I think a good rule of thumb, both in our course and in most cases in biology, is to stick, let's say, to one significant digit. So I would write it something like this. And I would do it approximately. Double tilde, that's the mathematical symbol for approximately. It wouldn't be the end of the world if you do it like this. Although I would say it's a bit too much. You could do 3.3 .3 as a reasonable thing. This is, I think, useful if you just want to do like order of magnitude uh, calculations. Which probably, like if you're writing in a paper or something like that, that's not what you usually do. You sometimes do so, just such things, but that's not very common. So I would go towards that direction. If you're doing it this way, by the way, there's also a mathematical symbol to denote this, which is what? Yeah, the single tilde. So if you, if you want to present it this way, you do it single tilde, meaning order of magnitude. If you're doing this, this is approximately. And then you're not, you don't feel bad about for yourself that you divided that might think that you're bad in doing the vision that you don't know that 10,000 divided by 3 is not 3. So you just do approximately. That solves most of your problems in life. And you could do more, but at some point you're running into looking funny. So I think this would be almost like push it, probably would be pushing it too much. In just one sec, yeah, please. It's, it's not just looking funny, it's probably wrong because you don't know that all three of these cells are exactly 3.33. So you would be wrong by saying that it's 3.33. Like it would be more accurate to say that it's about three than to say that it's this number because each cell could be somewhere in that range. Okay, so I love it. So there's two different points here. One is when, when I gave you this information, what did I mean? It was kind of like, I'll call you in five minutes. I was saying, you know, 10,000, a pretty round number. So that would be one issue. The other thing when you're saying 3.33 or like when you reach that, it, like, it conveys a sense also of something like that the cells might be more similar to, to each other than what they are. Even though I am talking in any case about the average uh, volume, etc. But I, I agree with you that this conveys a sense of like I more. Know this. I yeah. know that this is the size, yeah. Okay. If, yes? What about the option of the plus minus sign? Okay, so, so this goes back to the comment that was here given, and I think that's, that's a very accurate thing of like, okay, what's your uncertainty? Okay, so really if we were like coming from, you know, doing particle physics, the, the really, you know, rigorous way to say it is, okay, tell me this 10,000 plus minus how much, and then I could do all sorts of error propagation in the division, also you tell me what's this uncertainty on three, are you sure it's three? Or it might be two, like there's a, you know, 0.1%. That you could do the, all that, and then you come up with exactly what would be the plus minus. That's really nice when you have all of that information. It is very, very rare in biology that you have like really, you know, wonderful accuracy on things. Like plus minus you do have many times, but doing all the propagation, it depends. So I agree sometimes it's useful, but very, a lot of times in discussions, the, you're actually conveying the uncertainty through how you write it, okay? Like, by the fact that I wrote it this way, I'm, tell, I'm sort of like giving you an information on the plus minus, even without saying it explicitly, because I never did like a really good uncertainty analysis, but I'm still conveying some information, right? This tells you it's probably not 1%, right? Also not 10%. It's like, you know, 50% or multiply divide factor of two or something like that. Okay, so, after all this long discussion, we want to move on. If you need to, like, the rule for this course is use one significant digit. Okay, if I try to simplify things. Okay? Unless something strange happens. In your research, I suggest whenever you 
publish something or do a presentation, don't use more than two significant digits. OK. But there's also, uh, that's not always true. Sometimes could, somebody could think about a case where you might want something else. Just one second. So the question is, except for the fact that like, usually we'd like to keep you know, one significant digit or maybe two significant digits, when would it be that like, actually you might want to have more significant digits? Yes? If we, have, we want to compare uh, treatments, let's say, and they are very close to each other, but they are significantly different, but you can see it uh, only by using more than one or two significant digits. Great. So, so I completely agree. It usually happens, for example, when, you, when you're subtracting two numbers, two big numbers, and you want to look at the difference, then it might be important. Let's take a concrete example. Let's say I want to know what's the increase in the population of Israel in the last year. Okay? So what's the population of Israel now? Nine million. Nine million, right. So what was it last year? Nine also nine million. OK, so this is not very helpful. It's like one significant digit. You did well. You understood what I said about significant digits. But you see, it's in this specific case where you're doing subtraction, like I worked hard to find you the example, right? Usually the one significant digit is a good rule of thumb. But for things where you want to subtract two things in order to get something that's a small fraction, you want it to be more accurate. So if I'm not mistaken, it was 9.3, how much? 364 million. That was last year. And the year before that, I think it was 9.2, what was it? 4.5. 1.5. 1.5? One OK, so what's the increase in the population of Israel last year, like in one year? One to the five. OK, so now we could do it like you know, roughly, it's about 100,000, right, from 9.2 to 9.3. You want to do it more accurately? So it's 0. Point, uh, we should do it properly. It's like 1, 4, 9 times 10 to the 6. OK, so about 100, so you could say 100,000, or you could say 150,000, or you can say 149,000. I'm fine with any of the three answers. But it does show that we needed to use more significant digits. Uh, and it's, it is such a case. By the way, when, when you look at this, you understand like what's happening in Israel, right? Like, it, like 100,000 or 150,000, what's that similar to? Yeah, like what? Chobot. Like a Chovot, the city where the Weizmann Institute is at. So every year, we're adding another Chovot in Israel. With the, you know, with the land footprint, it's no joke. Like it's really like if you think about like you know, you know the map of it. It's not easy to find a place for a new Chovot on the map every year. I think it shows a lot about like the pressure of development and what happens with the demography. What are the implications? for you know, the environmental challenges and things like that. Okay, so it's also, by the way, I think a good rule of thumb, if you want to know something about the increase in the population in the country, one Rehovot per year. Actually, it was September this year, it was two Rehovot already. Wow, so it's Tel Aviv. Again, you're saying? Until <laughs> September this year, we went to 9.593. It's not even okay, so he, here's an interesting thing. So Hadass was pulling something from Google that now she says actually two Rehovot per year, right? So I don't know exactly, yes? You don't count, you, are you also calculating death rates? Okay, okay so there's two different. So let's, answer, let's talk about this for a second. Is this birth rate? Or is it death rate, or what's happening here? If it's the population size, and it's yeah. also taking into account the death rate. Right, so we have the birth, and we have the deaths. We have, we have a subtraction of that. That gives us this change. OK? And so, OK, there's a different point here saying, actually, it's two Rehovots per year, because it's how much? What's the difference? 9.593. Yeah, which comes up to? 200 and a bit. 
Okay, so okay, so the, the suggestion is that so I say you know it's worth checking. I'm guessing there's something of a mismatch here. I don't think it could easily go from one rehovot per year to two rehovot per year, like in a year. Okay, so here, okay, so this, 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 it's interesting to discuss this for a second. Okay, so we're saying, hey, there's actually something that we found on the web that suggests that it's actually twice that rate last year. Okay, and now we're saying, ah, okay, there's all sorts of mechanisms that could explain it. Maybe it's because it's a non linear thing, right? Like it's incre rap rapidly increasing. Or maybe it's because uh, there's immigration, aliyah. What else? Coronavirus. What? Coronavirus. Corona, maybe some, yeah, some effect of the corona. The people didn't have kids. Now they do have kids. I don't know. They had a lot of time to be with their spouses at home. The war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine. Okay, so that's another option, and that like it's a bug. What do I mean? It's you, probably not a, a, a simple bug that somebody typed wrongly. It's all something about the definition. We need to see what month we're talking about and what month before. Maybe it's like talking about November, but it's comparing to something that happens in January, so it's almost like two years. It's interesting to check. I think it's just, it just shows you. I'll be very, I'll be shocked if like the rate of increase changes from one year to another year by more than ten percent. Okay, these things are very robust. Demography is super robust. It changes, but on a long time scale. So it, it requires something really bizarre to go beyond that. Even something like, anyway, we could talk about COVID-19 and what it did to population. You know, it, it had a lot of excess deaths. I would be surprised if that would give you a change of many tens of percents from you. But, you know, we could check. Okay, let's move on. This, we, could, we could spend the whole two hours just talking about like things that relate to that, but I wanna I wanna move on. Okay, but you remember the the rule of thumb, which is one significant digit. If you're doing something else, you should at least to yourself give like a good explanation. And sometimes it, what a way to do it like along the way you might use two significant digits, and then in the end you just round it or anything along those lines. Good. Something else that's worthwhile <coughs> uh, mentioning, and, and that takes us into concentrations. So very often, when we want to talk about concentrations, we'll be talking on the one hand on volume, such as you know, uh, like a milliliter, which is a common thing we'll measure. And then in in, uh, <coughs> in, uh, in when you want to talk about concentration, you want to compare it to weight. So you'll be talking about milligrams. And it's very common to do this connection on the one. Uh, milliliter and one milligram and work with that. Anything that uh, that might create a problem here when you're doing this conversion? One or milligram. like, yeah, it's not one milligram. The density is usually taking the same water. Which is so I saw many times moving from this, you know, th that's what you would expect, but as was pointing out, that's actually not the case. One milliliter does not weigh one milligram. So what's happening here? One mil uh, uh, what's the best way to do it? Yeah, one milligram. Uh, I could just show it as a, yeah. Let's talk about this. If you want to look at the at the weight of this, it's one milli, but liter is a kilogram, right? So you can think about it as like one milli. Kilogram. And milligram times kilogram, this is one in a thousand. That's a thousand, it becomes, uh, it turns into So therefore, this would be, uh, I did write it very clearly, but this leads to one gram and not to one milligram. Okay, it's like a trivial thing, like you know that, right? But still, it's in, it's, I, I, I had, you know, Many times when I see that this, like you get confused with this, so I just wanted to point it out clear, and that means that it's true for everything. Like when you do, you can often connect one microliter to one microgram, and again you'll have a factor of a thousand mistake, okay, or one nanoliter to one nanogram. 
So you should always remember it actually goes this way, like there's a factor of a thousand between this and this, or between this and this. And that's just because uh, a liter is a thousand grams or thousand milliliters, etc. Okay, trivial, but I just wanted to point it out. Okay, good. So let's move on. Where is my eraser? So you might remember we, we ended uh, last time with uh, a short teaser, which was um, how many hydronium ions are in an E. coli cell. And we had several options. One was 10 to the 2, excuse me, 10 to the 2 to the 1 to 10 to the 3, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7, and 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9. The question is kind of clear. And you know, hydronium ions, H plus or H3, uh, H3O plus, you know, useful in many, many reactions. And we like to do surveys. So who's voting for A? One, thank you. Who's voting for B? Four people. Who's voting for C? The majority, 100% to with one significant digit. And, uh, and a few are voting for, uh, for D. Okay, so keep in mind that your intuition led you here or somewhere else, and we'll come back to it uh, soon. And the way to uh, come back to this is through another rule of thumb that I want to develop together. And that goes with the following question. <clears throat> uh, What is the concentration of one molecule in a bacterial cell? Is it about a one uh, picomolar, b one nanomolar, c one micromolar, d one millimolar. Okay, so what am I talking about? I want to give you a rule of thumb how to go from absolute numbers like one molecule, several molecules, some number of molecules in some volume. We'll do it with the bacterial cells because that's like when you want to talk in biology, it's useful to walk, talk with bacterial cells and you can do all the rest. And now is like our basic component would be one molecule in one bacterial cell. And the question is, what is the effective concentration? Which might you know, rub you the wrong way because we think about concentration, something where you have many things in some volume. But you can think about it like on average, effectively, etc. The question is clear? Okay, so now let's try and get an answer by uh, you trying to work it out. So let's take five minutes. Try to work it either by yourself or with the person sitting next to you so you can uh, try and, uh, and come up with uh, checking each other and thinking together. Okay? If you have any questions, thoughts, feel free to come. Oh, hot Okay, it's it's beautiful to see the the shared discussions. So let me tell you like, what, what, how I try to approach it. I try to use uh, one thing that I know I'm always allowed to do, and that's multiply by one. Okay? So let me show you one, uh, uh, one way to do it. So 
We want to know what, what's the concentration and what do we, we have this as a starting point, right? So we have one molecule per one bacteria. So far so good? Okay. <coughs> so now I want to multiply it by what? I know that one bacteria is equal to what in terms of volume? One micrometer cubed. Okay, so okay, let me show you what, what's happening here. I'm starting with something on the left-hand side, one molecule per one bacteria. I want to end at some point at other units. What would be the other units I'm looking for? Yeah, I want it to be something uh, molars, which is, which is what? What is molars? So it's like uh, moles per liter, right? So now basically what I want to do is something of like just unit conversions from here until I get to here. And I just need to change the units. So I need to get from molecules. In the end, I want to have moles. Instead of uh, bacteria, I want to have liters. Okay. And the way to get there is just every time multiplied by one, but playing with the unit such that it brings me to the right place. Okay. So there's different ways to do it. So I'll just, you know, improvise one of them. So I multiply it such that I have one bacteria per micrometer cubed. Good. So this would now, if I do that, I'm getting rid of the bacteria. I'll have molecules per micrometer cubed. That's still not enough. I need to do something further. Okay, so let's maybe just, let's do it. Uh, should I write them all or do it this way? Okay, let's do it this way. So what do I have now? I have one molecule divided by one micrometer cubed. So far, so good. Okay, what would I do next? So moving from here to liters, that's what you want to do? Okay, so how do I do that? I write one micrometer cubed at the top, and I want to do liters here. And now the question is just how many liters are in a micrometer cubed? How many? could be a bit confusing, right? Is it 15, 18, 21? Who knows? Okay, so this is too fast for me. Okay, I don't have to work so, f so I don't have to go so fast. Let's go to something that would be easier. Meter right, meter cubed. So one micrometer cubed, how many meter cubed is it? Okay, so micron to meter, that's six orders of magnitude. And because it's all cubed, this would be six times three, 18. So that's 10 to the minus 18. Or is it 10 to the 18? Is there a minus or not? Okay, so the way it works, you always have to have the thing at the top because it's equal to one. The thing at the top should be equal to the thing at the bottom. Okay, now meter cubed is a lot versus micrometer cubed and therefore this should be the small thing. So it's 10 to the minus 18 and not 10 to the 18. Good. So we did this. So what do I have now? I have micrometer cubed going with micrometer cubed. So I have one molecule divided by 10 to the minus 18 meter cubed. Okay, now we could do the, the trick with the leader, right? What would I do? I, I have a meter cubed, one meter cubed, and I want to turn it into liters. So how many liters are in a meter cube? A thousand. Okay. You can think about also in, I like to think in weights. So this is a ton and this is a kilogram. You have 10 to the three kilograms per liter, uh, per ton. Okay. So now meter with meter. So now I have one molecule and 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the 3, so 10 to the minus, minus 15 liter. What do we need to do next? So now we need to go from moles into molecules. How do I do that? Same thing, I multiply by 1. So I have 
moles here and molecules here. And I have one molecule. So how many moles is it? Or actually I could do it differently also, just, uh, just for the fun of it. I don't have to use the one mole. It doesn't have to be one to one. I can do anything I want with the molecules to moles. Let me show you what I mean. I have one mole. How many molecules is it? Six times 10 to the power of 22. Right, this is the Avogadro number. Six times something, something, something. And we remember the six, we don't remember what's the other thing, right? 23. Okay, so it's more important to remember the other thing. That's way, way more important. It's six times 10 to the 23, which is just like 10 to the 24 for my purposes. So I'll just say, and if you want, I could do it here so you'll be happy. Okay. So one mole, 10 to the 24 molecules. Great, so now this is gonna, just like we had up till now, let's use something colorful to make our life. Uh, so here we had bacteria and bacteria. Not the best. Then the, we had the micron with the micro cubed. We had the meter cubed with the meter cubed. And now we have the molecules with the molecules. And we're left with 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the 24, that's 10 to the 9. But it's at the bottom. OK, so let's write it properly. 1 divided by 10 to the 9, which is 10 to the minus 9 molecules per liter, which is 10 to the minus 9 moles, which is 1 nanomolar. Uh, just one second, yeah. So to make a long story short, we came with 1. But I think you got the notion. I did it, it, it seemed like it takes a long time. Sometimes it does, at least in the first time. But actually, as you see, there's like really nothing sophisticated here. But when, when you get the hang of it, you can do it like really quickly. And we also came up with a nice uh, rule of thumb. That if we have one molecule in one bacterial volume, it's a concentration of one nanomolar. So far, so good. Yeah. How do they get to the 10 to the minus 18 here? Yes. Not, not that. This one. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying I have one micro. So okay. So I had I had things in units of micrometer cubed. And I know that I, I know that in the end I want to go to liters. But that's a lot of jumps. So I said let's before going to liters, let's go to meter cubes. Okay. What's the relationship between a micrometer cubed and a meter cubed? It's like the relationship between a micrometer and the meter, which is a micron is 10 to the minus 6. But it's because it's cubed, it's like 10 to the 6 fo fo factor of 10 to the 6 in each direction. It's three-dimensional, so it's like six orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude, six orders of you're getting 18 orders of magnitude. Okay, is this useful? I would make the claim that it's very useful. Um, and let's, uh, let's take one concrete example. Let's say, okay, let's get rid of this, yep. What? <laughs> it should be one, no, but it's not one. Which one? This one that I deleted yeah. or this one? No, the right side. I don't hear. Okay, the right side. This one. It was one micro. Uh, what? Micro, <laughs> and this was one. Yes. So you're saying, is this equal to one? That's the question, right? It's not equal to one. It's not equal to one. Why? OK, so every time I'm multiplying this with something divided by something, I'm claiming I'm multiplying by 1. And I think if you check afterwards, you see that this is equal to 1. Then to the 6 and then to the minus 18. 
Okay, so it's this thing with the three dimension effect. Let's talk about it a bit later. I, th I think it might be a bit confusing, but I think we're okay. So let's take the same, uh, now that we're equipped with this uh, rule of thumb. <coughs> and the whole thing with rule of, rules of thumb is that you can take whatever you have and apply them to other contexts. So let's take one such context. Let's say instead of, uh, now I have a molecule, but now it's not sitting inside the bacterial cell. Now it's sitting in the mammalian cell. Okay, in the mouse cell. What would be the concentration? What? Good, okay, so I have two answers already. The same, and we have pico. Anybody wants to, maybe mili? No, but there are so many H plus uh, ions. It's not one molecule. It's not just mm -hmm. the volume of the cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we're not, let's wait with the H plus, H plus. We'll get to that soon. Now I'm just talking about like the, one. yep. It's one molecule that's like not a that gets, so it's gonna be in a much larger volume. You're gonna have much smaller concentration of whatever you're looking. I don't know what that number is. <laughs> okay, so now we have, instead of bacteria, we have a, a mammalian cell, so much bigger. And then, as the, as the statement here is given, the concentration would actually be lower, okay? Because you have the still one more in a bigger volume. How much lower should the concentration be? In proportion to how much bigger the volume is, right? How much bigger is the volume? Thousand. About a thousand, right? Because you remember, we had these rules of thumb of like one micron for the size of bacteria, 10 micron for the size of a mammalian cell. And of course, it could depend on what type of mouse cell it is exactly. But in terms of orders of magnitude, it's probably would be about right, unless you choose a very specific thing. So if before we had a rule of thumb of one nanomolar, now the volume is a thousand times bigger and will be at one picomolar. Okay, it's still the same molecule, the concentration changes. Okay, so here's just like, we didn't repeat the calculation, right? We could have repeated the whole calculation. No need to do that once we have this rule of thumb in our head. Okay, now let's move to something else, but uh, let's, let's relate it still. Let's say I have, um, what is the number of molecules of, anybody here studying uh, signaling in some way? In, in cells or some interesting proteins? Just throw out the name that of protein you're studying. DNAK. Which one? DNAK. DNAK. STAT. STAT. LSV. LSV. CD4. CD4. Anything else? Okay, so we have a few good uh, molecules. Let's say I'm taking any of those proteins. Uh, I know very, uh, for a long time there was this uh, protein study at Weizmann, P53. Anybody heard about this one? No. Yeah, so it's somehow relevant, no. <laughs> I see the no with, uh, so yeah, it comes up also with, uh, I guess, with in, in studies before in biology. Uh, so the question is, what is the number of molecules of P53? in a cell. And you know the funny thing? I was asking this question to some of the people who actually discovered P53 and, uh, and its friend MDM2. And like I'm talking about people who've been studying it, not in the undergrad, because in the undergrad nobody knew about it yet. Like they discovered it in their you know, PhD postdoc, and then they've just been studying it for the past 30 years. Not only them, but also all the people they were working with in their lab, in the conferences, etc. So what did they answer? <coughs> it depends. It depends, which is a great answer. So I told them, of course it depends, but you know, roughly. So is it about, let's say, I don't know, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 9, 
10 to the 11. How many do you have there? And you can do it not only on P53, you can do it on the LSV, CD something, also yeah, like these things we're spending months and months studying or years and years. And the question, okay, what, how many are there inside the cell? Which cell, whatever you want, but let's make it a HeLa cell or I don't know, something else. Anybody wants to guess? So who's, who's voting for 10 to the three? I see, I know, a third, who's voting for 10 to the five? The other third, who's voting for 10 to the seven? The other, other, 10 to the nine, 10 to the 11. Okay, so people have like decided, okay, this is clearly not the case. But here it's like, what? and the interesting thing is like, so okay, so how do we approach this? Anybody knows anything about concentrations in, of, of proteins in cells in what you're studying? Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting to talk about, okay, like a big machine inside the bacteria, but when I was talking with these people, in terms of concentrations, that's something that they had much better intuition than for absolute numbers. Like 30 years in the field, they didn't know what they didn't know what was the absolute numbers, even like orders of magnitude. But if I was asking about the uh, concentration, that was kind of like easy to say. It's about one micron, one, uh, one micrometer, one micromolar. Sorry, I'm, I have too many units in my head this, uh, this morning. So like one micromolar is is a rule of thumb, they carried from just, you know, they've been doing these experiments, you know, lots of graphs throughout the years, etc. So that was something that was, uh, that was around. The question is, how do you turn from one micromolar, roughly, into a number of copies? Yep. We, we know now that the concentration for, if, if there was one molecule in the mammalian cell, it would be a one picomolar. Uh, and we have a factor of 10 to the 6 for one uh, micro or so we have about 10 to the 6 molecules. Great, great. So you remember the, the rule of thumb for mammalian cell was one picomolar is equal to one molecule. So from one picomolar, three orders of magnitude up, I'll have a concentration of one nanomolar. Another three orders of magnitude, I'll have one micromolar. So that would bring me to 10 to the 6. Okay, so we're sitting somewhere here. Which shows I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I know exactly what it is, but I know roughly where I'm sitting. Let's say somewhere between 100,000 copies and 10 million copies. Okay, about a million copies. Which I think is also a nice number, like somebody asked you, how many? A million. But then you know it's a million, it's not a billion, and it's not a thousand. If I was asking you uh, instead, where's the eraser? I somehow find a way to lose it. There's not many degrees of freedom. How can I lose it? But somehow I'm losing it. So let's say I was asking you, the same question, uh, but instead of P53, uh, I would, would ask you on water. And just for the fun of it, let's make it instead like, like any, like let's bring it back to say bacterial cell. We could add more options. So how many molecules of water do we have in a bacterial cell? A lot. A lot. As in? So how would you approach this? Anybody knows anything about the concentration of water? Okay, so you might, so maybe one day like you can derive it, but it's something like 50 molar. In a, in a, in a cell? In a cell. Yeah, how can we derive that, by the way? Maybe you don't know that. The density, maybe. Okay, so we're talking about, right, what is the concentration? It's number of moles per liter, right? 
how much water is in a liter? One liter, <laughs> right? Okay, but what's the weight? One, ki one, kilogram. one kilogram. So right, like inside cells, outside of cells, who cares? It's like all water. So it's like one kilogram inside the liter, right? How many grams is that? A thousand grams, okay. Now if I want to go into, uh, now I need to know number of moles, I need to know what's the molar weight of water. How much? Yeah, 10 is good, I like 10. But just for the fun of it now, let's make it a bit more. So oxygen is 16, I have two uh, hydrogens, 18. Let's make it 20, okay? So I have a thousand grams. We have 20 grams per, per 20 Daltons, sorry. 20 Daltons. So a thousand divided by 20, it's 50, which is the number that somebody remembered, like 50, this 54, 55 molar. Okay, we could do with 10 and we're gonna get 100 molar. I don't care, it's, it would have been just fine as well. Good, so we have this 50 molar. Okay, what do we do from here? Yeah, we, divide, we multiply by one, I like it. Yeah, so that's exactly what we'll do. So we, want, we have 50 molar and we have, you know, question mark. We have one nanomolar and we have one molecule in a bacterial cell, right? So I can just go one micromolar, that would give me 10 to the three. One millimolar, that would give me 10 to the six. One molar would give me 10 to the nine. So 50 molar would be 50 billion. Okay, so if next person, you, if you're trying to think, okay, what, what's, in the, what's the number of molecules of water inside the bacterial cell? It's kind of like the number of people on Earth. Five times more. Okay, but maybe like, you know, it's like, it's a world filled with, you know, lots and lots and lots of people the size of a, of a water molecule. Okay, so I think enough of that. You understood how you can use this rule of thumb, right? But just to prove it to me, why don't you go back to the original question we had in the beginning and try to rethink this question about the, uh, the number of ions inside a, a bacterial cell. So we, we're missing something in order, to or, in order to answer it, right? There's, there's one missing piece in order to be able to use what you have. What is the missing piece? Yeah, you need the concentration, right? Where would you get the concentration? Yeah, the acidity or pH, right? Which is what? Seven. It's not 10, we could make it 10, but it's seven. So the pH, here it's important because it's a log scale, right? Yeah, you're right, yeah. Here, here it makes a difference between seven and 10, but this is like a crazy situation where you're doing working in log scale. So pH of seven, what does that mean? out of 10 to the 7 molecules uh, of water molecules are. Okay, there's a suggestion here about like, the, you know, 10 to the minus 7 out of the water molecules. We could get back to it in a second. But it's actually pH is defined as the log of, minus log of the concentration. Okay, I think it's like, like literally, I think like H is like the H plus if you want. P is like the, you know, something with the log. And there's a minus, so that's like the minus log of the concentration of H plus. That's equal to seven, which means that the concentration of H plus is 10 to the minus seven molars. The P is for power. Power, ah, great. So P is power, which is like, uh, yeah, the power is like the exponent yeah. of 10. I love it. So it's the power, the power of hydrogens, and somehow it's a minus. I don't know, they, they didn't want minuses, so. It's like the power 
in minus. No, because the concentrations are always tend to minus something. Okay. Okay, so we have 10 to the minus 7 molar. Okay. Can you help me? How do we get from here into the, into the answer for this question? We know one and multiply by 1. It's great. Now, every, all the answers are 10, and everything you need to do is multiply by 1. <laughs> so, so I have 10 to the minus 7 molar, and I'm saying, okay, how do I convert it? Remember, we had like a rule of thumb, how to go from concentrations into absolute numbers in the molecular world, in the microscopic world. Right, so we had the rule of thumb was one molecule, one nanomolar. What does that mean? Right, uh, molecule bacterial cell, you're right. Oh, bacterial volume, actually. It's actually bacterial volume is a better name because I want to move between vol I don't care about cells so much. I want to talk about like sizes, like volumes, which are my units, this one micrometer cubed. OK, so how do I bring it together? Yeah, 10 to the power of minus 7 molar. OK, so 10 to the minus 7 molar. Let's go to nanomolar. How much would that be? So that would be like this, let's multiply by one, right? It's a one, I want, the molar needs to be at the, at the top, so I want to have one molar at the bottom, and I want to have nano molar, so that's 10 to the nine. Right, I multiplied again by one. You can see I got confused for a second. Why, because I was putting the molar at the top, but no, I need to get rid of the molar. So I'm getting that I have here 10 to the 2 nanomolar. So we're very quiet now, right? Why are we so quiet? Because it sounds confu uh, surprising, right? Like, like the, the, the math led us into saying, oh, it's 100 nanomolars. One nanomolar is one molecule. So 100 molecules or 100 ions in this case. So this is the answer. But isn't the question about the mammalian cell? This was in an E. coli cell. What? OK, so now we're moving into a, trying to find also excuses for ourselves, whether it yeah, makes it sense or not. Who knows what's <laughs> happening here? But, but we, did, we did the math. And let's say before we talk about the you know, biological aspects, etc., I just want to show you again, you know, I hope I, if I'm not convinced you now, I know wouldn't never convince you. It's a useful thing. Right? Like this one rule of thumb enables you to know about water, about pH, about P53, about your protein of interest. It really enables you to go from one thing to another pretty easily without needing to every time do the calculation which by itself probably you would never do because you would be afraid of like just dealing with this thing, even though it's only multiplying by one a few times. Okay, so... But isn't it really surprising? It's only 100 Yes, it is. <laughs> That's why I chose it. No, it's, it's, really, it's really, I think it's, it's super interesting. Um, there's a lot to discuss if you want. I have, you know, I, I was corresponding about this with some people studying those things. I think one thing that helps, you know, uh, think about it is A, these things also diffuse very fast. So you can talk about how long is, does it take until it reaches, you know, if you have some, some catalysis of some reaction, it actually reaches that very quickly. That's one thing. And then there's also the lifetime. They have very short lifetime, meaning that like they annihilate, like they, this every H plus meets uh, OH minus. They diffuse quickly, and then they reappear somewhere else. Not, not themselves, but like some other water two water molecules turn or one turn into H3 or plus, which means that at every different location, if you need this, it actually appears all the time. All the time, we could do the calculation. And that means that like actually it's available, but just for a short lifetime. But in the short lifetime, we could already do the reaction. So there's all sorts of things to be said about how this still enables you us to be alive and kicking, even though it's a small number. But I think it also shows like it raises many clearly raises many questions you would never do 
Like we were all very happy with knowing pH is seven and live our life without any worry, right? But now when we know that pH seven has a meaning with absolute units, now we became curious about it and it raises new scientific questions. And I think that's the utility, in, at least in, in many ways. There's all sorts of other aspects in which I think absolute numbers are useful. And that is the fact that we have a great intuition for absolute numbers. Okay, like if I'm asking you about nanomolar, what does it mean? Micromolar, millimolar, picomolar, I don't know. It's usually quite confusing. We don't have a great intuition for that. If I'm, I, I bet you, you would not get, you might get confused about a nanomolar versus a picomolar or a micromolar. You would not get confused about a million dollar versus a thousand dollars versus a billion dollars. It just wouldn't happen. We're like, the, these absolute numbers are something we have intimate relationship with, not just dollars, but you know, just a thousand people versus a million people, you would not get confused. Like absolute number is something we experience, we know, etc. Okay? Okay, there's a lot to be said more about it, but we don't have that much time. So I would put you in, in like one uh, challenge for the, for the recess. We'll take a, a short recess. And that's the following. I want to do an experiment with you. So, you know, we all like to travel. So I want to travel in order to do this. I invented an experiment so that I can go travel. And the idea is to enable us to really think more about both like concentrations, absolute numbers, etc. So we were just talking about this rule of thumb of one nanomolar, right? What is the nano? 10 to the minus 9. So, we often talk about these things, you know, easily I have one nanomolar affinity there, but let, you know, I'm trying to think, okay, what does it mean, this affinity of nano, 10 to the minus 9? So I'm thinking about, okay, what, what does it mean, this 10 to the minus 9, or 10 to the 9? So let's do the following experiment. I'm traveling to the equator, and I brought with me uh, a green ping pong ball. Okay, I like to play ping pong on the equator, so I'm putting this uh, green ping pong ball, and now, I want to see the concentration of one nanomolar. It's like, you know, one in a billion. Okay, so now I'll put, I'll start walking along the equator and I'll be putting what, just normal ping pong balls, white ping pong balls, one after the other. I'll be putting a billion. And then again, I'll be putting a green ping pong ball. And then I'll put another billion, another green ping pong ball until I go through the whole earth. Okay, I'm doing a circumference of the world, and the question is, how many green ping pong balls would I be putting all together? Okay, let me repeat that again. I like playing ping pong on the equator, so I'm doing this thing in order to understand what does a billion mean, 10 to the 9, which appears a lot in nanomolar, is number of people in the world, all sorts of things. So I'm just putting one and then a billion ping pong balls, one ping billion, blah, blah, blah. and the question is how many green ping pong balls would be all together? The distance between two balls? Uh, ball, whatever, you put them one next to the other. Okay, order of magnitude, you don't have to be sure. Okay, the question is clear. So take it with you to the recess, five minutes, come with an answer, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks for coming back. So, just as a short announcement, um, exercises, the next exercises, uh, the next exercise will be available online very shortly after today's lecture, and you have two weeks until you need to hand it in. Okay? We appreciate your hard work, you're getting two weeks. If you have questions along the way, write us an email, we'll try to help. Okay. Anybody played with uh, ping pong balls during the recess? Do we have an answer? One. Okay, let's see, let's try, how, how do we do that? So, to do the calculation, it's good to know something about the Earth. That's the Earth. Okay, let's do it quickly. What's the, what's the relevant size that I need here? So I need the circumference or whatever it's called. Okay, how much is that? So I don't remember. The only thing I remember about the Earth is I remember the radius, which is how much? 
6,000 kilometers. That's kind of like what I carry in my head. 6,000 kilometers, and then I, I have everything I need about the Earth. Because if I have this, now I do remember there's like 2 pi in order to go from radius to the whole circumference. So that's 6,000 times 2 pi is equal to what? So that's another 6, 6, 40. <laughs> Forty thousand kilometers. Okay, what do we do from here? We just multiply by one, right? So that means forty ten to the six meters. Okay, because I just multiply by ten to the three meters per kilometer. And now let's go to centimeters. So that would be forty times ten to the eight centimeters. So far, so good? Okay, and now I want to go to ping pong balls. Okay, so now I want to multiply it by what? One ping pong ball divided by how many centimeters? Yeah, few, so let's make it four, just so it would be easy. Four, it's a big ping pong ball. Maybe it's more like a ten, between a ping pong and a tennis ball. Okay, so I'm multiplying it here by one. So now I have four, uh, like now centimeter and centimeter, that's great. I have four and four, so I have 10 times 10 to the eight. So that comes out to 10 to the nine. Okay, so I'm putting one green ping pong ball, I'm putting 10 to the nine white ping pong balls, and I'm back where I started. What does it teach us? Yeah, so I, I agree. A billion is a lot. Okay, that's what it teaches me. Or let's say there's two levels here. One, that a billion is a lot. Ping pong balls are small. Ping pong balls are small. The world is maybe not that large. Now, in, in units of billion, or let's say, it's an interesting way to say it maybe. In units of billion, the world is not so big in terms of linear size. You see what I mean? Right? Or another way to say it is like, we don't have a very good intuition what a billion is. Like, it's very easy, you know, I'm, you know in the newspapers, you open the news, I'm sure there's a lot of things that somebody wrote about a billion, like three billion shekels is the cost of this or that. Or, but it doesn't mean that we really have a good understanding of what it means in an intuitive way, right? Because it's like hard to believe that the billion is like going through the whole world with like small balls. Okay, so there's different ways. So I think it, it tells you something about how big a billion is, about the fact that our intuition for number, very big numbers is, is limited. And what was the other thing you said which I really liked? Ah, that the world in units of billions is not that large in comparison to a billion in, in, uh, in linear dimension. In linear dimension. Okay, there's more things that could be said about it, but we have a lot more to do. But let's, uh, let's, go, let's look at it from just one more thing that uh, we just thought about that could be interesting. Um, let's again talk about the world, but now let's talk about ants. Ants are a popular subject. So recently there was a paper uh, where they uh, reported that they did an analysis on the number of ants in the world. Anybody heard about it, something, maybe? It got some media attention. Anybody remembers what they found? So they reported there's 20 quad trillion ants. Maybe there's another L, whatever. Okay, what is this thing? So. Yeah, so quadrillion is a thousand trillions, and a trillion is like a, is a thousand. It's not quadrillion, it's quadrillion. Quadrillion. Ah, good. Okay, thank you for that. Quadrillion? Okay. So how much is 20 quadrillion? So we have a million, and then a billion, and then a trillion. 
15. Okay, so let's do it. Uh, so we had a million, 10 to the 6, a trillion, 10 to the 9, a billion, 10 to the 12 is a trillion, quadrillion, 10 to the 15. Good. So 20 times 10 to the 15 ants. Or so they say. Is it true or not? No. <laughs> How do you know? It's not going to be this strong. Okay, so here's the, here's the thing. Like, it was actually reported, you know, widely. And I think, like, it's the sort of thing that, like, you know, numbers are used as sort of, like, just like an ornamental thing. Nobody, you know, checks it. Nobody knows anything. It's just like a big number. Very impressive. That's good. Let's move on. Do something else. The question is, how can we take such absolute numbers and try to pass them through what's known as a sanity check, okay? To check that like it, whether it makes sense or not. Any ideas? Mass. What? Mass. Mass, okay, so, we, so let's turn it into, so what's the mass of an ant? Okay, it's tough, we could try and do it, but actually, you know, ants, you know, they vary by several orders of magnitude. We could try, but it's gonna be, uh, we won't get a very precise answer. What do you say? Land. land. What do you mean, land? Okay, so it would be nice if here, usually I just told you, it's interesting, I told you we, for many things we don't have a good intuition for concentrations, and then we're using, moving to absolute numbers, right? And I, I, I'm, I'm standing behind this, except for the fact that when you have like super big numbers, we're not very good at understanding very big numbers, but then we might be, maybe the concentrations would help us. So what's the concentration of ants? Ants were by this, the absolute number by the surface area. Of the Earth. Right, so we could do that, right? That's not so, let's see. So you remember we had the Earth, right? What did we say about it? 6,000 kilometers, right? That was the radius. So what's the area? Yeah, so there was something with 4 pi there, right? 4 pi r squared. Okay, so that often happens. You're starting to make steps, and then, so, and then actually it actually becomes more complicated. Because of what about it? So let's take it one step at a time. Okay, so let's wait with anything else. 4 pi r squared. Okay, so how do we handle this? This is like about, what is it? 10? 4 pi is about 10. R squared, so I need to do this squared. So let's do the following. 6 squared would be, so I have 10 times 40, which is 6 squared, times 10 to the 3 squared. So that would be 10 to the 6 kilometers squared. So what do we have here? 400 million square kilometers. Did you follow me? If not, that's also fine. You do it for yourself once or twice. Actually, the real number is about 500. So not very much off. Okay? We have ants all over, right? No, not in the land. In the yeah, land. maybe so just on land. So what should I take out of this? No. So it's nice. 10 is good, so 10%. But actually, there's a bit more than 10% of land here. So 30%, something like a third. Okay, let's take a... For land, what is this? We don't need this anymore. So let's take 100 million square kilometer. Okay, that would be the land area. Okay, the exact number I think is 150. Okay, US is 10 million square kilometers. China, 10 million. Canada, 10 million. Russia, 20 something. Okay, you sum it up together, and a bit more things, 100 million, 150. Okay, good. Let's try to wrap it up. So we have 100 million square kilometers. Does it make sense that you have 20 times 10 to the 15 ants? Let's see, let's move from square kilometers to square meters. What do I need to multiply by? 
a million, right? A thousand, you know, meters in a kilometer, but it's squared. So it's a thousand and a thousand, 10 to the six. So I have, this is 10 to the two, so 100 times 10 to the 12, 10 to the six, another 10 to the six, uh, meters squared, which is 10 to the 14 meters squared. So if I want to do the density, it's the number divided by the area. It's the aerial density, which comes up to 20 times 10 to the 15 divided by 10 to the 14. So I'm getting 200 ants per meter square. What do you think? Okay, so we just need a sanity check. And it came out sane. Okay, who knows? Maybe it's not 200. I don't know. I didn't see 200 here. But then in other places, maybe there's lots of them. Maybe they're very tiny. Some of them we could hardly see. So we just did a sanity check and it came out sane, which is nice because also usually, like if it's insane, it's like you get a factor of a thousand in some direction. Like if I would get here 200,000 ants per square meter, I would tell you no, too much. And if I would get, you know, less than, you know, 0. 0.00 something, I would say that's strange. As, you know, many places in the world you're getting a lot. Anyway, so it came out sane. Okay, so I just showed you how you can take these like huge numbers that usually people just, you know, look at them all inspired, you know, like, oh, wonderful, very impressive. And just by moving in this case to something that's like you can normalize it to something that you have a better intuition for, like some, like density, densities of ants per square meter is something you do have intuition for in contrast to concentration of ATP inside the cell. That's like not something you ever saw. Okay, good. There was a comment there, yeah. Why do we look at the area at the, at the actual surface of Earth and not like underground? Okay, yeah, so, so that connects also to the comment there. You could say, okay, ants live in, they borrow, blah, 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 blah. So then I should look at the density per unit, like what's the depth that we, it's true. We, you could do that, like the density volume, but then it just becomes way more complicated because I need to say, okay, what fraction of the ants live in the upper centimeter, in the upper 10 centimeters, in the upper meter, how it's a mess. Then I, I think here it's fair to say I'm looking at the aerial density. I'm looking per square meter. I know they wouldn't be at the heart of the earth. And then I'm doing it with these units. But I think it's fine. It might also connect to the fact of, okay, I don't see 200 usually in most square meters. But that's because I'm looking just at the top. So it's just those that went to forage. And then I'm saying 20, but there's another 200 just below them or things along those lines. Good. So, so assume that like, they can live anywhere because the, the land could... Right. So, yeah. So this assumes that they could live anywhere on earth. Clearly, they don't live, I know, in like some boreal areas in the Arctic. On the other hand, you know, you have your in own intuition, probably there's other places in the world, there's way more ants than what you're used to. And that kind of like maybe balances it out in terms of your intuition. <coughs> okay, next thing and uh, I want to do is to go through a quick uh, view of some, so try now to harness your, uh, <coughs> your visual intuition so that we'll, uh, we'll learn a bit more about uh, about concentrations. So let's start with orders of magnitude. Let's try to think again, just like we did for sizes, on the numbers of order of magnitudes that concentrations span. Okay, so we started with say one molecule in E. coli volume. And let's say we're going, and this is like, this, this is, as was pointed out, in some uh, components, you do have one per bacterial cell. So I think that's reasonable. Like that's like, happens physically. And then on the other side, you can go as far as like, you know, all the metabolites in the cell or something like that. So how many orders of magnitude do we have here? Or let's ask ourselves, what is this? What is the, what unit of concentration should be here? Nanomolar. Nanomolar. So what's the concentration of, that should be here for like the, good. And what should be the unit here? Okay. So you got it. So how many orders of magnitude is it all together? Oops. So we have about a eight orders of magnitude. Okay, 100 million. Okay, you could talk about the ratio of protein to mRNA, for example, talking about absolute numbers. So what you see here is like the concentration, I think it's in yeast of mRNAs and of proteins. 
What's the ratio between this and that? I have one to ten. But it's all often you measure these things in log two. Yeah, so you see, it's true, it's about 10 between this and that, but it's 10 in units of log 2. So how much is what the number gives you log 2 is 10? 1,000, right? 2 to the 10 is 1,000. Another good rule of thumb to remember, like 1, like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 128, 256, you get to 1,024, like 1,000, that's 2 to the 10. Is all the way make sense of the context of what we said about the ratio of weights between mRNA and proteins. So okay. it's true that the mRNA is heavier, but it's like it's only like ten times heavier. But it could for, for that it will use like a thousand, so it's like in terms of time. Okay, so here's like a here's like that, that's the nice thing about like you know rules of thumb or like remembering numbers from different time, you can just put them together. So like uh, if you remember, the, you see here a factor of a thousand, but you remember in terms of mass is like a factor of ten. It means that in terms of like, if you multiply the two in terms of weight, overall it should be like one to a hundred. Okay? There's all sorts of things about turnover, so it becomes a bit more complicated, but that's fine. You can now check your prediction. Okay, and that is basically, that's true for many things. Like really, indeed, this is like, now you see it like, there's really two thousand fold when you look at many, many, uh, different uh, proteins, mRNAs, many genes inside cells. Uh, people were asking me about like the H plus and then other things, other ions inside cells. So there's uh, all sorts of cool stuff you could get into. For example, when you look at intracellular fluid, uh, intracellular fluid, intercellular fluid, blood plasma, all the different components. First thing I want to show you is that when you look at the concentration or concentration times charge, they're always the same, the pluses and the minuses. It's something called electroneutrality. If not, things will go crazy because if you're not electroneutral, there's a super strong repulsion force or attraction force. So this has to be very tightly equal. Otherwise, you know, things don't work out. Okay, but what are these things? So let's just make a short uh, survey. You see something in... Uh, yellow, something in red, and something in blue. And the question is, which is which? And I'm also giving you an options if you want, like a bank of options on the left there. <coughs> so we have, uh, what is sodium, chloride, and what's the name for the other thing? Potassium? The, chloride. the yellow is sodium. Okay, you see the challenge? Okay, it's like a Okay, I'm thinking of trying to sell it to newspapers as like puzzles for the weekend. <laughs> in the meantime, yeah, you, you could see it's indeed, as, as was pointed out, sodium is the yellow, uh, potassium in red, and chloride in, in, in blue. You could also do similar puzzles, trying to see, okay, what are the resources of a cell going to? Like if you, the point that was mentioned before about the weight of stuff, Let's look at how the weights are distributed among the different components of a cell. Okay, so the question is what would be, for example, this, what we have here is like the, the total mass of a cell after you dehydrated it from water. And the question is what is the biggest fraction? Let's, uh, let's give you a few options. Okay, so we have two parties here, the lipid party and the protein party. So it's indeed the, the protein party. You can see the lipids, which, you know, is uh, somewhere between second and third. But I think this sort of like things is also, I think it's like this quantitative aspects. Now it's in the visual form. I think it would give you a lot of intuition about, you know, the investment of resources by the cell. You can do a similar thing on, say, the components of the metabolome, which is all the metabolites in the cell. So in terms of metabolites, it's like something very big in terms of amino acids, and there's something pretty big in terms of nucleotides. 
Anybody wants to guess? What would it be for, what's the biggest thing? So I had ATP, so that's for nucleotides. What about amino acids? What? Yeah, not maybe, glutamate. It turns out the, the story, like the, when the cell needs to decide you know, what to keep as a, as a free metabolite, it likes to do it with glutamate. Why? I don't have a great answer. Maybe which I think... Also for many other yes, but maybe there's also, maybe other... Okay, so the question is, okay, that's a good hypothesis, maybe because it's good in terms of the metabolism to be as a precursor. Now you go open the, the maps of, of, of metabolism and see if that's a good... If, if it holds. So what I want to show you is like when you have the numbers, it raises new questions. And some of them actually haven't been answered or even sometimes even haven't been asked. You remember we did this calculation, I think in the first lecture of how many proteins are inside the cell. And we got this rule of thumb that I hope you remember, like about 3 million proteins per micron cubed. So what's the concentrations of proteins inside cells? So I need to multiply it by exactly by this rule of thumb that each one is one nanomolar. Right? So I have three million. Three million. Yeah, so it, so it's three million times one in a billion, the nanomolar, one so that's Three per thousand, three millimolar. Okay, you just multiply by ten to the or you just multiply by ten to the minus nine, and you get three millimolar. And indeed, few millimolar is the concentration of proteins inside cells, all of them together. And you could also talk about the number of proteins. So we had three million per E. coli, but if you want budding yeast with three thirty micrometer cubed, notice it's cubed, not per unit. So it's a hundred million, or all together in the HeLa cells, it's about ten billion. Okay, so let's wrap up with the number of proteins in the different things. So I want to do, like, what would be the, I, I like this top 10 list, kind of like what you often do in sports. I like to do them in biology. <laughs> so there's all sorts of options. If you have something of that kind of biology you want to do, let me know. I'm super uh, curious about these things. I learned from them. So I want to do it for the top proteins inside cells. What are the top 10 proteins? Okay, so I think it's an interesting question, right? We don't have a clear consensus directly. So that's what we started doing in the lab. And if anybody wants, let me show you some of the results. And we have uh, some publications on that. So first of all, let's try to look, you know, big picture. Okay, what you see here is the whole proteome of the cell, which as you saw is the biggest component. So if you want to first order, except for water, this is the cell, right, proteins. And within those proteins, I want to see what functions do they do. So here are a few functions, and you can see it's really mostly these two. So what would you say they are? So I hear signaling and something else, right? So it turns out signaling is this. Again. So signaling gets, has just great PR. Okay, it gets a lot of attention. But in terms of how much signaling really, you know, requires in terms of the allocation of the resources of the cell, it's just this part. It's relatively very low concentrations. What really takes most of the resources is metabolism. And what is genetic information processing? <laughs> Yeah, it's all this thing going from DNA to RNA to protein. All this genetic information processing. A maschara shel DNA. Okay? So this is this is takes the the most. And again, signaling is very small. Do you, do you know yep. this is different than uh, multicellular organisms? Or is the... Yeah, so what I'm showing you here I think is for E. coli or so for like yeast. For, for yeast, yeah, for yeast, yeah. So this is for yeast. It would be interesting maybe to look. So let's try and see if we could get that information. Okay? But just to show you with the signaling, it also raises, I think, uh, on the one hand, 
Like, what is the reason why signaling is so low? One? Short life. Identification. Yeah, so short lifetime, identification, efficiency. Maybe it's not critical. Maybe on the other hand, if you'll have high concentration, maybe that would be, there would be problems. There's like this thing called crosstalk. That like if you have something a lot from, it would start activating other things, even just because it's a high, so there could be also, I think there's, again, I think it raises a question, and now I'm not going to give the answer, I'm not sure I know it, but it creates hypotheses, now you can try and start studying. What do we have here? Okay, now we could drill down into each of the, you remember here we had like, a, this was metabolism, and this was this information processing, so now we could ask, okay, the biggest components within metabolism and the biggest component within information processing, what are they? Out of all of those components. I hope you can just agree with me, it's interesting. Like it gives you a perspective that's like different from how it's being taught usually. Usually you learn, oh, there's this function, it has to happen this one. But now let's forget how people wrote the textbooks. Let's look not from an anthropocentric perspective of how we like to think about things. Let's ask biology evolution, what did it decide to invest in? And from that learn, get a, a, a fresh perspective. So it turns out it's really translation and then central carbon metabolism and biosynthesis. So for example, transcription is much, much, much smaller in terms of the investment of resources. How do you measure investment? Uh, this is just the mass, the weight of the prote proteins associated with that okay. function. Bigger proteins, it's not fair. If it's fair or not fair, we could talk. It's, I think it's a good proxy. You could say maybe I want to do it a bit differently, a different metric, but I think it's a good proxy. Okay, there's a lot more we could do. You could talk about the ribosomes that were mentioned, try to dig into this. This was also, you could even look at, okay, what, are, what we started with, what are the top 10 proteins? And you can see the really things related like anolase and things like that are related to metabolism, like what you learned in glycolysis, or things like here, which are uh, elongation factors in translation. Anyway, you can learn a lot of biology with this. You can visualize, the way we visualize something called proteomaps, uh, or like Voronoi diag tree diagrams, which enable you to see things in much better resolution than usually. If you, so here's an example. If we took this and were presenting it as a bar diagram, or like as a pie chart, it's, you can't see the same type of resolution of like small things that you see. Here they'll just be buried in something super tiny. So you can really see things in much better because this effectively is one dimensional. This is also one dimensional, even though it looks two dimensional. But this is like truly two dimensional. Let me just try and wrap it up because I know some people need to go soon. So what I want to show here, doesn't matter. Uh, so somebody wanted to see about multicellular. So this is like, for example, a HeLa cell in Homo sapiens. This is at the level of the activities, like what needs to, and you can see actually like say cytoskeleton proteins are a much bigger deal in mammalian cells than in single cells. Also the unknown is bigger. That's also true, the, the unknown. And the signaling is much larger. And if somebody is still looking for a PhD and they don't know what to do, I would say a good suggestion is to go to this and find the biggest unknown and try to study what does it do. Assuming you like studying proteins, choose the biggest unknown and try to reveal what it does because Nature seems to care about it. You can also do it at the level of the really single proteins, and I, I even have names for this. It's just like these things that were not associated with anything. And if you want to study it more for different organisms, we built a database that enables you to go and study your favorite organism or like take your data and try to visualize it in that way. Okay, final thing, a teaser for next lecture.
So the, for next time, we'll be so we'll be moving from talking about concentrations to another fundamental physical uh, thing, and that would be rates. And the question for you is, what is faster? A, transcription, B, translation, or C, um, roughly the same. Okay, so we'll be talking about rates. And you might remember there's this thing called transcription, which says, you know, taking the DNA, turning it into mRNA. And then there's translation, taking the mRNA, turning it into proteins. And the question is, what is faster? Who's voting for transcription? About half. Who's voting for translation? About half. Who's voting for roughly the same? Four people. Okay. We have uh, something to wait for. All the best in the exercise. Thank you.